lecture, we are fortunate to be able to bring outstanding speakers to campus from time to time. Part of the university's mission go, is to go beyond the classroom instruction and bring thinkers and speakers from across the country to share with you a variety of new and we hope challenging ideas. We want to stretch you, maybe move you into some of your discomfort zone. That is part of education. So on behalf of the faculty, the almost 7,000 students, administration, want to welcome you. And now I would like to introduce our new Dean of Education, who will tell you a little bit about this lecture series, Dr. Dennis Patanacek. On behalf of the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies in Salisbury University, Ben Bienvenidos, and welcome to the Fall 2002 Real Lecture. This lecture is named for Pauline Rod, who is a longtime principal and teacher at the campus school at Salisbury University. A substantial request in Pauline Rod's will made possible this lecture series bring outstanding national figures in education to this campus. We are indebted to her not only for that particular gift, but for the tradition of giving that that began. We want to also thank and acknowledge the contribution of Mars Bozeman. Dr. Bozeman is Ralph's professor, and it was he who transformed the dream into reality. He is not able to be with us today, but his wife Carol is here, and I'd like to recognize her and ask her to stand. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the committee who put all of this together, Pat Richard, Jeff Ball, Carolyn Bowden, Namsa Galetta, and Joel Jennings. You've done a wonderful job. I'd also like to invite you all to the reception which will follow this lecture. And it is my pleasure to present to you um, our president, Jan Dr. Janet W. Eschbach, who is serving in the third year as president, Dr. Eschbach, will introduce our speaker. Damas y caballeros, bienvenidos todos a esta presentación de la serie real. Or, in other words, welcome all to this very special Ryle lecture featuring an outstanding educator and humanitarian who has made a difference in the lives of many young people in the community. Since 1988, the E. Pauline Ryle Lecture Series has been bringing extraordinary national lecturers from the field of education to our campus. The series has been funded, as Dennis said, by a generous bequest from the estate of Miss Ryle who served for many years as a teacher and then principal at the former campus school at Salisbury University. That former campus school building is now the home for the Seidel School of Education and Professional Studies. Ms. Ryle would be proud today to know that her vision for this lecture series has resulted in inviting so many important educators to Salisbury over the years. I think she would be especially proud and impressed with tonight's speaker, Luis Garden Acosta, the winner of the 1998 Heinz Award for the Human Condition. In 1982, Mr. Acosta and his wife co-founded El Puente, The Bridge, a human services organization 
that transformed one New York neighborhood. El Puente was designed to build a bridge between the churches, hospitals, schools, and residents of the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, New York, known at the time for its high crime rates and social desolation. El Puente succeeded in being the catalyst for the development of the entire community and its residents. Its central mission to inspire and nurture leadership for peace and justice has galvanized a human rights movement that toppled a proposed and legislated 55-story incinerator, shut down the city's least performing and most violent schools in favor of smaller schools, tore down a wall that segregated children in one of the area's public schools, led the state's most successful childhood immunization campaign, created Brooklyn's most comprehensive Latino Center for Arts and Culture, and built parks and open spaces for all community residents to enjoy. El Puente now operates the Academy for Peace and Justice, the first public school focused on human rights. Alumni from this institution have gone on to graduate from top universities across the nation. El Puente also runs a health center focused on family health, childhood vaccinations, and AIDS issues. This unique social action movement has spread to other communities with technical assistance from El Puente's membership. The organization estimates that the total number of persons affected by its services each year should be more than 10,000 individuals. Luis Garden Acosta has profoundly influenced the nature of community building and youth development in his own community. His vision has become a model for many other neighborhoods throughout the United States. I'm very honored to be able to bring to the podium, and please join me in welcoming Mr. Luis Garden Acosta. Gracias, Janet. Y gracias a David. Y gracias a Dennis. Of course, Holy Island, the Ryle family, Carol Bosman, the Ryle Lecture Committee that worked so hard, and in particular, special thanks to Dr. Pat Richards, who got me here. And all of you. Now, in New York, it's raining. I don't know. I don't know if we have a full house. And I just, I'm just amazed that you came. So I want to thank you for allowing me to share this moment with you. And greetings from the third hippest place in America. According to Ugly Reader and a lot of periodicals that track hipness, Williamsburg is the new Soho. And you can read on covers of magazines and read full pages in the New York Times about all the wonders of Williamsburg. A few years ago, I was in China, in Beijing. And I turned on the TV in the hotel. And there was Williamsburg in Beijing. Of course, they didn't mention anything about Latinos or Hasidim or Poles, or Italian Americans, or African Americans. It was this great new Soho. My community of Williamsburg is majority Latino. It is, in fact, the Latino capital of Brooklyn, a borough that, when I was growing up, was the borough with most Latinos in the city of New York. Of course, today it's the Bronx. It is also the worldwide capital of what is perceived as the largest Jewish Hasidic movement on this planet, the Satmar Hasidim. It is the beginning of Polish New York. It goes on to Greenpoint, but even Lech Walesa had relatives that he came to visit in my community. It is also a vibrant Italian-American community. Sometimes you see these movies where these guys are going to Brooklyn to get some food. Well, many times they're coming to my neighborhood. It's also a small, 
but very historic African-American community that traces its roots for generations in Williamsburg. It is also, according to the New York Times, some years ago, the welfare neighborhood of New York City. Because in my part of Williamsburg, the south side of Williamsburg, which was the most concentrated Latino neighborhood in the state of New York, more than 50% of my community is on some form of welfare or public assistance. And it is also recognized by everyone as the most toxic neighborhood in New York City. But poverty and polluted air was not what we were thinking about in the late 70s and early 80s. In a 12-month period, from 1979 to 1980, we lost 48 young people. primarily from my neighborhood, the south side of Williamsburg, who were bludgeoned to death and shot to death in what the media termed the teenage gang capital of New York City. And everybody, Donahue and Geraldo and everyone, had a special on the south side. Juxtaposing what was happening in my community with what was happening in East LA. And it was tough, it was tough. I found myself in 1980 as the director of the Office of Community Medicine, and I had seven different departments in this local municipal hospital that served my community. And I had the Department of Psychiatry, ger geriatrics, uh, the chaplains, uh, nutrition department, a whole bunch of departments, but none of them equal the stress and the horror of running the emergency room. You know how people say, thank God it's Friday, and there's a chain of Friday restaurants here? Well, I used to say, thank God it's Monday, because nobody died on Monday. None of my young people in my community ever came dead on arrival to my hospital on a Monday. It was a beautiful day. Tuesday was good, too. Wednesday was all right, but I began to get that sort of sinking feeling in my stomach. By Thursday, I was afraid. Friday, we were into it. Saturday was a horror. And this was every single week. Think about it. My community, the south side of Williamsburg, was then about 35,000 people. That's a little bit over half of the seats in Yankee Stadium. And think of what it meant to lose one young person in such a small community every single week. And you knew it was going to happen. It was like going to Yankee Stadium on a Sunday and knowing during the seventh inning stretch that we're all gonna get up and stretch and some crazy madman is gonna come out with a newsie and just mow down a bunch of kids and everybody was gonna get up except one. And you knew it was gonna happen, just didn't know when or how. And so if you're running a hospital, or helping to run a hospital as I was, what do you do? Well, the first thing that came to my, to my mind was, well, I mean, I've got to be down there. I'm going to stay the whole weekend. I'm going to, I'm going to really see what's going on with my emergency room on a Friday night and a Saturday night. I'm going to live it because I know that if I'm there, I'm going to be able to think of something. This has got to stop. And I remember it was only 6 o'clock on the first day that I attempted this on a Friday. And sure enough, 19, nearly 20-year-old woman came in, dead on arrival mother of a four-year-old. She had gone to visit her mother in the South Side. I guess she had moved away. And uh, as people tell me, she had asked for the blessing, which is customary in our community, La Bendición. Left and walked right into an impromptu gang battle. Caught a bullet, bullet and I guess died at that moment. They rushed her in, and I was there. Of course, all of us now watch all these medical shows, so we know what, what happens. And they try to resuscitate her. They try to bring her back. And they couldn't. And since I was there, I said, try again. And they did their whole thing again. Try, try. Flat. I said, try again. And the doctor looked at me, took me to the side and said, Louise, she was dead when she got here. You know, we tried. 
and I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let it go, and to this day, I still hear the screams of her husband. There was no morning room. There was, it was an old and antiquated hospital that really needed to shut down. In fact, I led the movement to shut it down. And there was nothing he could do but scream. What will I tell my daughter? How can she be dead? What will I tell my daughter? It's still ringing in my ears today. And I was so terribly moved by the whole incident that I just said, God help me. Somehow, some way, this is going to stop. I didn't know how. I didn't know how I could stop it. But I knew I had to do something. So as any good hospital administrator, I guess, you know, we have lunches. And I asked anybody who had ever had any relationship to young people in the past, who was doing something with young people now, who wanted to do something in the future, to come to my lunches. And people came. I had something like nine, ten, I can't remember. There was a lot of them. And I, was, I would always ask the same thing. Why are our young people dying? And what can we do about it? And invariably, I remember this almost as if it was yesterday, somebody would get up, Luis, I will tell you why our young people are dying. They're dying because of that brand new fancy high school, Eastern District High School. 4,000 students, my eye, they all drop out. What we have to do is blow up that school. Because if you blow up that school, kids aren't going to drop out. They don't drop out. They're not going to form gangs. And they're not going to kill themselves. So let's do away with the school. At that point, I thought he might have been on something, you know? But the idea that the school had some culpability in this was not too far off. Let me tell you how bad this zoned high school of 4,000 students was in my community. And let me tell you how it is that we had the highest dropout rate in the state. Our controller, the controller for the city of New York, did a study on Eastern District High School, which was at least two or three times on the front page of the New York Times as the most the least achieving school in the city and arguably the most violent. She studied incoming freshmen, about 1,000, 1,200 incoming freshmen. And she tracked them to see how many graduated in four years. Guess how many? 84. 84 out of 1,200. So he wasn't too far off. But someone else said, what are you talking about education? You know, I'm here. Do you think my mother and father had an education? They're barely out of high school. Didn't tell me I had to kill somebody. I wasn't, trying, I wasn't raised to be a criminal. I'll tell you what the problem is. It's sex. Kids are having sex. They're having kids. They're having kids at 14. I know, Luis, you've got a clinic here. You know, you don't talk about it, but I see these little kids coming to your clinic. You're for pushing this stuff. I did. 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds. I just organized a, working with the nurses that you really have to work with. Um, and reorganized everything without going through the protocols of the Health and Hospitals Corporation in the city of New York so that young people could feel somewhat supported. And someone else said, oh, come on. You're going to say sex is why kids are killing each other? Come on, sex is all they have. What do they have in this community? And someone else said, yeah, that's right. You know, and someone said, well, but why, why do we have a, the highest juvenile crime rate in the city? That's ridiculous. Why are we snatching pocket uh, books, uh, pocket uh, bags from old ladies and uh, chains from women? Why are we doing that kind of stuff? And someone else said, well, what do you expect? I mean, what are we doing for these young people? There's not one center in our community for adolescents. Beyond a gym in the YMCA, which is all that they have, there's nothing for them. And at some point in the meeting, I would always get up and say, you know what? I want to thank everybody. Everybody's point is on target. And someone would invariably say, well, we couldn't all have been right. And I said, yeah, you were all right, because you know, you all hit it as a whole. You know, you can't separate the mind from the body and the body from the spirit and the young person from the community. And that's what we've done.
the pacification of the war on poverty, the getting rid of community action and people organizing to empower themselves, left in its wake in my community, in many communities across this country, basically storefront offices, which were referral agencies to referral agencies to treat for disease of some sort. And in that process, we began to categorize ourselves as having a head problem, a, a below the, the belt problem, a, an education problem. And we forgot, we couldn't see our kids as total human beings. Those of us who were a little hip started talking about being at risk. Well, I'm more at risk than you are. You know, our community is totally messed up. My block is totally messed up. Therefore, Mr. Government, give me the money, not him, because I am really at risk. It was almost a contest to see who, who could describe themselves in the worst situation to be able to avail themselves of the little funding because we're talking about 1982 now. We're talking about the height of the Reagan cuts in this country, and in the city of New York, the height of the Koch cuts, which came out of our fiscal crisis. So I said, okay, why don't we just all get together and do this ourselves? And start working with our young people ourselves. And someone said, after I got them together in some kind of a development team, and people wanted to do something, I said, but Luis, you are going to get the money, aren't you? People had known that I had another life, and I was part of the mayor's office in that other life, and as a very young man, I actually brought money into the community, lots of money, in the heyday of the war on poverty, when it was about community action. And I said, no, I can't do that. I said, why not? I said, because all the funding that's out there is about treatment, it's about services. It's about looking at our young people as if they were sick and only because they are sick. And the little prevention dollars that are out there are again pejorative because they're about a disease, preventing a disease. And we've got to end that. We've got to be able to embrace our community for being what it is, a vibrant, creative community that is about development. And that means that we can't take government dollars because there are no government dollars for developing an integrated human being, a body, mind, spirit, and connected to community. Well, that didn't go well with some people, and they left. And that was good. Those who stayed, those artists and educators and health workers and priests and nuns and um, people from the various churches, parents, young people themselves became the development team of El Puente. And on July 21st, 1982, we had a coming out party and declared ourselves as El Puente in a former Roman Catholic church, which was abandoned, actually because it was a missionary church to the Lithuanian community, which didn't exist in Williamsburg anymore. And so we worked it out with the diocese through our uh, local housing development corporation to be able to use this 10,000 square foot building at cost forever. And we opened up and we told people that what we wanted to build was a bridge from hope to social justice, but that it would take all of us and that we could do it. And when people ask me on the development team, please, you know, I'm with you, I, I, I get it. You know, we have not been looking at our young people as our young people. I have told them a story about about the city councilman. I went to see the city councilman early on and before I had the lunches. And I, I had been away for 10 years from my community. I lived 10 years in Massachusetts and I came back and I went to him and I said, you know, Luis, this is the horror. This is the killing fields. We have to do something about these young people killing each other. And they said, what for, Luis? Why? They're gang kids. Let them kill each other doing us a favor. And I told the development team how much we had to counteract that, counteract that thinking and how while we built it went there, we had to do something about that politician. And politicians like that were not about love and caring and about really representing us. So there we were. And people
people said to me, well, Luis, you know, this is nice and we're here, but, uh, you know, you know, what can we do? I said, we can do a lot. First of all, I will volunteer some doctors and nurses. I'm sure I can get some people, some social workers, other people who are working in the hospital to give a few hours a week. So we can start with that. Now, what can you give? And I turned to Francis, and Francis said, well, I, I just started an arts group. It's basically my brother and myself. He teaches fine art, I teach dance, because some of the dancers are pretty good. They could actually teach other kids. I said, terrific. What can you give? <laughs> Someone said, well, you know what? Actually, I've been, you know, I'm actually, I can teach, I can play piano. I've been, had to take these lessons as a kid forever. And I'm not good enough to play professionally, but I'm, I think I can do a beginner's class. Great. And what can you do? And if I did this in this room, I would probably set up another appointment right here in Salisbury. Because all of you have skills. And it, just, but it was an amazing process because we all began to realize, gee, we're adults. We have life experiences. We have skills that we can impart to our young. How did we forget that? How do we think that the only way that we can reach our young is, with, is to pay professionals to, to do that? How did we forget that we could have, make a contribution? We could do it all the time, obviously, we need professionals. But in a, in a crisis situation like that, how did we forget our humanity? But we did. And it was amazing when people turned on, and I remember there was a, a senior citizen in the group who said, you know, Luis, I, I make these dollies, and they're very popular. Caribbean, and every time I try to knit one of these, and a young person's around, invariably I show them how to do it because they're very interested. They want to learn how to do it. I think you do a class on that. I had a separate development team that formed of young people because they wanted to have their own team, and they came up with ideas of martial arts and break dancing and all kinds of stuff. Volunteers that they went out and got, and before you know it, that when there was a going concern with no money other than a little coordinating uh, money from private foundations like the New York Community Trust and the New York Foundation, very little, not enough to pay me even. Um, I had to be a volunteer for about a year and a half or two. Everybody did. But enough to pay some people part-time so we could keep things going. And certainly enough to pay the rent. And that's how we did it. Two nights became three nights, and three nights became four and five, and now it's, you know, what it is, practically all week, and not only in the main headquarters, Point is still the church, but across the street, the school uh, where we run what the city calls a beacon, or the neighboring community in Bushwick, where we have another center, or the community health and environment unit that has its own storefront. All of that because people dared to struggle. They dared to look into themselves for what and who they were. From 1982, we worked on developing this model trying to uh, break out from the kinks of this prevention language and, and this disease-oriented kind of way of working. Um, we started, first of all, going to the gang leaders, getting their permission. I went to each and every gang leader and said, uh, you know, we're going to try to start this center. I don't want to make any judgments about your life, but I was wondering whether you would support us in allowing this center to be a neutral zone for your younger brothers and sisters. Just for them. Nobody in the gangs. Just for them. And they all said, sure. Why not? Well, you know what happened? Three or four years later, there were no more recruits. There were no more gangs. I can't explain that enough. But basically, by having a center there where young people can engage in get the kind of nurturing support, com comradeship, getting a closeness and bonding that they were trying to get from the gang. But now they were doing it in ways that they could actually lead major movements for change in their community. They didn't have any interest in gang banging. It played out. We also connected with national and international struggles organized marches against apartheid, and against intervention in Central America, and against police brutality, and effectively began to look very clearly at the Universal Charter for Human Rights, those 30 principles, and said, this has to be our gospel. Because these 
are the principles that all of humanity believes we are owed. And there's much responsibility that goes with expressing those principles. And that's what our bridge must be about. So we created our own way of talking about those principles that ultimately became the 12 principles of the Puente. But basically, there were four cornerstones. The primary one, the most important one, of course, without which we could do nothing, was to create community. Our principle of building a Puente was to create community wherever we are. The second one is almost a corollary, but it is the fuel of our community, without which we cannot have community. And that principle is love and caring. So in everything that we did, we had to be about creating community. And in everything that we did, we had to, of course, promote love and caring. And the third cornerstone was mastery. It was not good enough to get by. That was the problem. That was the problem coming out of professional systems of education, of public health, of government that it was all right for the poorest community in the state of New York to get by. And it was all right for young people that they could just maybe even graduate from high school. And it was so infectious that some of our own people were internalizing this, like, oh, well, what can you do, you know? We're poor people. No, we're poor people. But we come from proud traditions. And we can make major contributions to this world. To do that, we have to be about discipline, about mastery, about excellence in our work, in everything that we do. And the last principle, of course, is the all-encompassing principle of peace and justice. For what purpose? For justice. And always to seek peace. It took us until about 1986 to get all that going, to have a broad program of activities, to working every day. Yes, by that time, we had succumbed and taken a government grant. I mean, it's, I, it's, I, you know, I never tell this story, but let me just share this with you. It's really about my roommate at Harvard. Um, he was then assistant commissioner at the, what is now the Department of Youth and Community Development. And he comes by one day to a point and he says, hey, Luis, what's happening? I said, Roberto, what brings you here? He says, well, I gotta return $25,000 to the city coffers tomorrow. I can't do it, please. So what's the matter? He says, I know you need it. I said, Alberto, oh, no, I'm not taking any city money. Not until the city council is out, not until we really have the kind of you know, representation that is moral. And he said, well, please, just write me a letter saying that you need the money. I don't want any strings attached. I don't want any of this crazy treatment stuff. We're about development, you know. We're focused on human rights. He said, no, just take the money. And he was true to his word. I wrote a little one paragraph letter, sent me 25,000, and we were off and running. That, of course, now today is a budget of about three million, not including the school, which is another million. Um, and uh, like everybody in the state of New York, we are very apprehensive <laughs> about the cuts that are coming because we have a horrendous uh, budget deficit in the city and soon to have one in the state. In 1986, actually on the first day of school, I had actually on that day was coming back from Puerto Rico. In five years, I didn't have a vacation. And worse than that, I hadn't seen my mom. And I'm used to seeing my mother at least once or twice a year in Puerto Rico. Because of a point in all the work that we were doing, I just, it just happened that I didn't see her. She was very upset. So I decided, okay, things are going well now. Let me go see mom, take a few days off. I came back on the midnight flight, the cheapo flights, that they don't have them anymore, but it was like nothing, from Puerto Rico to Canada. And I was sleeping late. When I get a call, this is the second day of school, Luis, you there? I, uh, No, no, no. You wake up, Luis. Wake up. We need you. What is it? Juan's arrested. Juan Beltran arrested. This is a 15-year-old 
model young man who wanted to be a police officer and was on a point that's board. I said, how did you want to be arrested? Luis, it's a, it's, you're not going to believe this. I said, try me. So they built a wall at PS16 to segregate children. I said, is this some kind of a joke? Because it was Ralphie, he's the jokester. You know, he's always playing these practical jokes on me. I said, Ralphie, come on, I gotta sleep. No, 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 no. Luis, you gotta get Father Steve. This is serious. When he mentioned Father Steve, I said, oh, it must be serious. But what are you talking about, Ralphie? I said, well, they, they built this wall to segregate kids. No, no, they actually did it. They got away with it. What are you talking about? So I get Father Steve, we go to the precinct, we get Juan out, and I hear the whole story. Juan was on his, cutting, well, on his way to, to El Puente, cutting through the Hasidic community, when he hears this commotion right in front of PS16. PS16 is this elementary school of some 776 children a block away from the head Hasidic rabbi's home. And parents are saying, no, that's not possible. We're not going. We're not doing this. There's no way. And he learned from the parents that a wall was built to siphon off the wing of the school, the wing that had its own separate entrance so that parents could actually deposit their pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade children in the classrooms. And that that no longer was for them. That would only be available for Hasidic young women who are benefiting from the Title I remedial education programs. Because the year before, the Supreme Court had decided that no longer could public education officials, teachers, go into parochial settings. That, that would be in conflict with the separation of church and state. But that those young people, those parochial students from religious schools, could actually go to the public schools. And that, in fact, the public school system had an obligation to provide that. So the decision was made, as only could be made, in what one chancellor of the New York City Board of Education termed the most colonized school district in the city of New York, School District 14, encompassing Williamsburg and Greenpoint, could only have been done there because although we had some 19,000 students, some 26 schools, although 71% of those students were Latino, 93% of these students were students of color. Only 7% of the student population was white, largely from Greenpoint. Young people, for some reason or other, didn't get into the school. Although this was the case, the school board was totally run by the Hasidic community that had not one child in the school system. And by democratic operatives of, in the Greenpoint community who wanted to keep the contracts going that the school system, the school district provided. And so they decided that the way to do it was just build a wall there, bust the Latino children out of there to other schools, and provide for their immediate education on the same time. Well, the parents weren't happy. These were not parents who had any experience in any kind of movement in the past. The most that some of them told me that night as we got together to talk about everything was that they had seen the civil rights movement on television. They had never participated in any kind of movement activity. But here they were screaming and saying, no, my child is not going. 776 children did not attend school that day. Nobody went to school. And then the parents said, so what do we do now? And Juan was there. I said, Juan, you know, he said, look, I'm from El Puente. I'm on El Puente's board. And, you know, we've gone through a lot of situations where what we do is we try to form a line around the problem. And we, and we yell out, the people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. And that changes everything. And the parents looked at Juan and said, are you nuts? We can't do that. He said, listen to me, of course you can. Look, what does the police fear the most here? That the Hasidic community and Latino community are gonna get in some kind of confrontation, right? 
So as soon as we get this line going around the school, guess what's going to happen? The police cars are going to come like crazy. And, what, and then what's going to happen after that? The television cameras will come. And we'll be on the 6 o'clock news tonight. It'll be over by tomorrow. You know, the parents looked at this 15-year-old and said, no, he has a point. That's true. The police cars will come. They'll form, they'll create instant barricades. The television cameras will come. And that will end it. So even though they were very embarrassed, you know, as they told me later, uh, they followed one. And they were very shy about it. They were kind of like bowing their heads and kind of hoping people didn't see them and they would say, the people united. But the once said would say, louder, louder. People united. Louder, they're not gonna hear you, the cops aren't gonna come. The people united, and then the cops came. I said, well, that, that's over. <laughs> and the television cameras did come after that. And we were on six o'clock news, and the next day in all the newspapers. But it didn't end. Nobody wanted to ruffle the feathers of the Hasidic community. So the politicians were mute. The mayor was mute. The head of the teachers union said, no one said anything about this outrage to our democracy, about this war of segregation. Nothing. It was like it didn't exist. So the parents were disheartened. I talked to them that night, I talked to them the next day and said, look, we just gotta keep doing this. We just gotta be out there every single day and sooner or later, people will come to their senses and bring this wall down. And every day we were out there. Nobody went to school. The teachers stayed in their classrooms, did not join the parents, did not stand for the US Constitution, did not support people in their rights in a democracy, stayed and looked behind windows from 9 to 3 every single day. And every single day I called the New York Times, look, you've got to look into this. You've got to have an editorial. I knew if the Times said something, people would move. Finally, about uh, a week and a half into the struggle, like maybe close to two weeks, the New York Times wrote an editorial, Unwise Wall in Williamsburg, and wrote about how horrible this was and how it had to end. Because we had gone to court, and Judge Constantine, may you rest in peace, said, and I quote, in this case, you can have separate but equal. So there was no relief from the court, at least the lower courts, and we, of course, were moving up to the, to the higher courts, but that was a process. And, and the mayor wouldn't say anything. And so when the New York Times did say something, then the mayor said, of course that wall has to come down. And the union leader said, of course it has to come down. And everybody just joined in, but they wouldn't do it until the New York Times said it was OK. And we went on another two weeks like that, a full month. For an entire month, nobody went to school, the longest boycott of one school in Brooklyn's history. Finally, that wall came down. And the group that we had formed, United Parents Against the Wall, we used to say, up against the wall, right? United Parents. <laughs> Got it, huh? <laughs> Became United Parents to Save Our Children. The next year, there was a school board election, and for the first time, we elected, in 20 years, an actual Latina parent to sit on the school board and an African American minister and, that, minister, and that was a major success. Now, in the fall of 1990, 75 heads of state, you might remember, came to the United Nations to a children's summit to proclaim the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the extension of the Universal Charter of Human Rights focused on young people, the rights of young people all over the world. And they supported, came to support this convention. Even President Bush, senior, came. Of course, we haven't, as a nation, signed that convention, uh, along with, I think, no, there isn't any advanced uh, nation in the world that hasn't signed. And the reason we haven't signed it, by the way, and this is a bit of an aside, is that we refuse to relinquish the right to execute young people. And according to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, 
no young person may be executed on this plan. Be that as it may, we were in the throes of celebration in New York City because we had just elected our first African-American mayor, David Dinkins. And Dinkins asked that we should judge him by what standard, what his administration did for young people. And so when the summit was happening at UN, he said, oh, we're going to have our own children's summit, a whole children's week in New York. And I'm going to appoint leaders in every borough to move activities in the borough, to focus on the needs of children, and to begin to get people to understand what was happening at the UN. And so he asked me to lead the, the efforts in Brooklyn. And I thought about that. And some of my colleagues said, well, this is a great opportunity to do you know, Kodak moments, have young people doing nice things, get some good press about what young people can do. And I said, I don't think I'm going to go that route. Because we have a real problem in Brooklyn. We had just had the killing of Yusef Hawkins, an African-American young man who goes into an Italian-American community looking to buy a car and is killed simply because he's black. We had a young four-year-old, Jessica Corrales, in East New York. They had been, the whole family had been at a, a day trip and the father was bringing up one child and Jessica was asleep in the car. And uh, so he was came, coming back down to get Jessica to bring her up when a shot rang out of nowhere right through the car and killed her. We have a six-year-old on his grandmother's couch in Fort Greene uh, projects where I was raised on the safety of his grandmother's couch. We would assume a shot goes right through the door and kills him and on and on. And when New York News Day had almost a daily tally, in fact, they were running a tally, young people killed in the city, and most of them were from Brooklyn. It was what we had gone through in the late 70s and early 80s, happening all over again, but this time for a while. So I felt that if the if 75 heads of state from this world who couldn't see eye to eye could get together on behalf of young people, maybe, just maybe, we could get young people from those very young people that knew the young people who killed Joseph Hawkins. Young people from Bedford-Stuyvesant, from Brooklyn Heights, from Crown Heights, from all the different communities in Brooklyn. White young people and black young people, Latinos, Koreans, Asians of all kinds. Jewish, Islamic, and Christian. And young people who believe in God. Could we get them all together in one place, El Puente? Could we have a night called Brooklyn Youth Building Bridges for Peace? And could we get them together to talk to each other? We supported young facilitators to do it. And I will tell you, it was, I thought, a very hopeful night here for the first time ever, it seems. Young people were actually going to talk to each other. And they did. And it was not initially. And right away, a young person said, I'm glad I had this opportunity to talk to people like you. I think it was a black young man who was talking to some white kids from Bensonhurst. You people are the problem. You know, you killed yourself, Hawkins. You're always on us. You think we're inferior to you, but we're not. We're better than you, actually. And the white young man said, oh yeah? You know what it's like being the minority in the school system? You know, I'm white. You guys don't know what it's like going to a school that's all black and Latino. And the Asian girl said, oh yeah? Well, pox on both your houses. You think I'm invisible. And Latinos basically said, oh really? You don't even respect us. And that's how the night started. I said, oh my god, if this weren't at Fuente, we would be in trouble. But we worked it and worked it about an hour, or hour and a half, and discussion going back and forth, and finally, as you would pray this to happen, it did happen. A young woman, almost her voice cracking, said, I want to say something. I've been hearing this all night, and I want to tell you all, you don't have to be afraid of me. I'm not going to do anything to you. I don't want to do anything to you, but I don't want to be afraid of you either. I want to end this. I want to have some peace. Someone else said, yeah, how, can we, how, how come we can't talk like this other places, in our own schools? How come nobody gets us together? I mean, 
I'm learning things here. I mean, I realize that it's not just me that's afraid. It's you too. And someone else said, yeah, well, why can't we have a school that teaches us this kind of stuff? Someone else said, why can't we have a school for peace? Someone else, and justice, because if there's no justice, there's no peace. And so he said, all right, let's go out and demand that we have in Brooklyn a high school for peace and justice. So the next day, we're at Borough Hall, and we get the former president to say, I'm for a school for peace and justice. And the chancellor of the, of the Board of Education says, well, I'm for a school for peace and justice. And all the politicians say, I'm for a school. But then they say, well, you know, there's no money. We have problems. It's going to take a long time. And thank God for Chancellor Joseph Fernandez, who came in and working with the Fund for New York City Public Education, a not-for-profit group, which is now called New Visions for Public Schools, offered the city of New York to let a thousand flowers bloom. If you had an idea for a school and you wanted to sponsor it and you were chosen, you could get to create your own school. Well, most of the schools that were uh, proposed were from educators, teacher groups, parents and teacher groups. But a few of them weren't, like Del Puente, a community organization. After we realized that Joseph Fernandez was for real and the Fund for, city of New York was for, re Fund for New York City Public Education rather, was for real, we submitted a proposal and our idea was this. We want to build an extension of El Puente. What we have been doing from 3 to 9 p.m., we now want to do from 9 to 3 as well. We want to use the same methods, the same project orientation, the same inter interdisciplinary approach, and the same focus for peace and justice, and we think we can succeed. None of us were educators. Frances was the only one who actually had her license, because she had majored in education and had actually gotten her license from the New York City Board of Education, never used it, but kept it current. I would always make fun of her and say, you're never gonna go to teach. She said, oh, you never know. Well, that day came, because when, it, when we decided that because Fernandez did, in fact, choose us, that we had to have someone at the helm that was really El Puente, so it really would become an extension of El Puente. It was Francis that we turned to. She founded the school. She led the development team and did it masterfully. Before we got into the school, though, before we started in 1993, we had a crisis. A young man coming out of the library in 1992 in Eastern District High School was stabbed in the back. That was it. Finally, parents had had enough. It was over. And these are now parents of PS16. So they had a little history and experience in boycotting. And they called for a parent boycott, which was successful. Closed down the school in a day, we had the right chancellor, the right set of demands, and within this sort of focus of the city media, I declared on behalf of El Puente that we not only shut it down for a day, but that we permanently shut down Eastern District High School, and that in its place we create four, or five, six brand new schools with their own principals, small student bodies, uh, teaching uh, teams uh, to develop their own uh, way of working their own theme. And the Chancellor bought it and said, fine, Luis, write it all up and we'll entertain it and we'll put it out there and we'll put up the RFP. <laughs> so that's exactly what happened. Eventually, Eastern District High School was closed and the four schools built. And for the first time today, I can report that they are no longer on the Board of Regents list of failing schools. They're not the highest ranking school in the city. Um, they're not you know, even in the middle area, but they're no longer a failing school, and they're making progress. <coughs> About the same time as this going on, actually 1991, we had another problem in our community. It was like plagues, you know, one plague after the other, after the other. This time it was something pretty unforgivable, actually, when you think about it. Young people were dying. But no longer was the teenage gang violence. Um, it was something that was so preventable. 
that it was shameful that we were allowing children to die of the measles. The state of New York and the city of New York had done everything possible. They had put ads in the paper, on radio, in Spanish, ads in the subways, and somehow they felt they were failing because people weren't coming into the municipal hospitals to get their children vaccinated. So they called upon us, and I went to a meeting with some young people. And young people immediately said, well, you know, they're not gonna wanna go to Warhol Hospital. That was a replacement for the hospital that I ran. Brand new hospital, but huge, and you go into the emergency room and spend hours, even if you're dying, much less for a vaccination. And there was no understanding of how to do that, where to go in this huge system. And, and, and they said, we'd like to go to our block, and we'd like to see, right behind El Puente, what people think. So they did a study, and out of 100 homes, 60 had heard about the messages, were very concerned, and did want the vaccination. And so our young people said, well, suppose we provided the vaccination at El Puente next door, would you come? I said, of course. And so those young people became the MASH ministers, part of the MASH ministry. MASH meaning medical, alternate, and sexual health. We're into acronyms. But in this case, it was an acronym born of a reality. When we got into the church, this is something like El Puente, actually. kind of looks like it a little bit. Um, all there was were pews. So you take the pews out, and what do you got? An empty home. So where am I going to facilitate intimate medical examinations? So Father Steve said, why don't we put up a tent? I'm going to put up a tent right there in that corner. And I said, a tent? He said, yeah, like a mash. <laughs> I said, OK. He says, I got the tent. I said, OK, we'll set it up. And that's what we did, actually, 100 uh, medical examinations in that first year in that tent. So the, the name stuck. So anybody who worked in the clinic now was working for MASH, and of course, these were now MASH ministers who did everything but actually put the vaccination in. You know, they, they literally did everything. They handed the vaccination to the medical professional. They did, they organized everything. They read the charts. They did everything. Uh, they want, we wanted the young people to be able to do the vaccination, but by law, we were forbidden. So we said, okay, we'll, we'll allow it, but we'll do everything. And that meant that young people work and develop a schedule so that as people came in for their appointed time, they never had to wait. In fact, their young person was taken through a whole fun house, all through El Puente, through the back building. We have a back building. And every room was something great, of music going on, some kind of picture-taking process, some artistry, some, it was like Disney World. By the time they got to the vaccination, they didn't know, they were having so much fun. They said, give us the arm, we're not sure. <laughs> and out. And those, those kids who weren't frightened said, can I come back? <laughs> Had a great time. Well, in 10 days, they vaccinated 1,006 of their younger peers and saved lives. Now, the mayor looked at that and said, my God, that's amazing. The UN approached him and said, you know, the city is bad. And he's, Vaccinations have to take place. We're in very many ways like a developing country when it comes to childhood diseases. So he said, at point there, would you mind doing another clinic just so that my commissioners could see how it's done? And then if we could learn how to do it, I'd like to spend a whole day doing it for the entire city. And would you leave that? And so we led that. Actually, it turned out on October 16th, 1993, to be the opening day of the Academy. It was, the, it was not in September because there was this lead poisoning scare and all these schools had to open up late because of uh, the lead poisoning abatement. Of course, we did our own abatement and it never came to check. Uh, but we opened up. And how did we open up? This is a school for peace and justice and human rights. We opened up by, by doing another 100 vaccinations for young people in the community. We opened up by serving 700 meals to people in the community. We opened up by um, declaring that we were going to reforest the south side in our community where there were no trees, that as of that week, we we're going to start to plant trees. And now when you go to our community and see all these trees, they were all planted by the academy. We opened up by providing all kinds of music. We brought in a, uh, a rock band, actually a rock band that could do salsa, that could do jazz. And the point of this group of young people, they're all young, was that they were all disabled. And we were trying to make a point about the abilities of all of us. 
It was an amazing day, and it was an amazing opening for a school for peace and justice. And some other amazing things have happened along the way. Like, for example, this whole welfare scare. You know, when the new legislation came out, it meant that, for the most part, people had about five years on welfare, and then it would be over. Now, half of our community, as I said before, is on welfare. You know, while 67% of adults 25 years or older in New York City have their high school degree, 68% of our adults 25 years or older do not. Many of them cannot speak English. So what do they do? How do they work? How do they get a job? How are they able to make an income if they're going to be thrown off welfare? Our young people, you know, started thinking about it. And one group, the youth organizers, said, well, we're going to do an economic survey this summer. And we're going to figure out how people are actually using their money. How is this money moving in our community? They did. And they came up with a plan to create an open market where welfare recipients and low-income people could sell their wares, what they cooked, uh, their crafts, and make money and thereby become entrepreneurs. And it worked, and it was so successful that the Today Show actually broadcast their weather spots, one of their weather spots, two of their weather spots, from our open market that Saturday morning. Another group, sort of uh, the continuation of the MASH ministers, although now they call themselves the CHE activists, CHE meaning C-H-E, Community Health and Environment Activists, uh, perhaps they were modeled after a certain doctor that we know. <laughs> At any rate, they were very interested in the correlation between smoking in their homes and respiratory disease. So they actually did a survey, and they realized what we all know, that where their parents were smoking, there was a high incidence of respiratory disease and of asthma. So I remember the parents of the academy coming for a meeting, and I remember they presented this information that showed their charts and everything else. And what I was absolutely blown away by was how shocked the parents were. Now, we all go along thinking that everybody knows about side stream smoke, that everybody knows the dangers of smoking in, in terms of their, their children. And yet, our parents didn't know. They were shocked. They were embarrassed that they had actually put their children in danger. They had no idea that they were doing it, and they immediately said, well, it's going to stop. And it was amazing. So, so we said, well, you know what? This might be a good thing to do, develop epidemiological skills on the part of our adults as well as our young people. And we need community health workers like this, and maybe we could do a major study of asthma. We know there's a lot of asthma in the, in the school, in the after-school programs, all over our community, so many young people and adults with asthma. We knew that it had probably something to do with our being the most toxic neighborhood in the city, but we didn't know to what extent asthma was so rampant. And so we developed our epidemiological skills. We trained our parents, and they did knock on 5,000 homes, and in three years came up with an incredible study. Now, yes, they found what we suspected, what was found in East Harlem and in the South Bronx, that we had nearly three times the level of asthma, average level of asthma in the country. But we found, we found out something else, too. We found that where there was a Dominican family living on the same block in the same building next door to a Puerto Rican family, the Dominican family had little to no asthma, and the Puerto Rican family had a great incidence of asthma. And so we couldn't understand it, and we wrote a paper, and we hypothesized about different various uh, further tracks and paths of study that we should take to answer that question. And for the first time in the history of the American Public Health Association, their journal published peer-reviewed scientific article from a community organization. Never before in the history of the APHA had a community organization actually published, been allowed to publish a scientific article. The, the, 
success was so great that the federal government, the EPA, gave us a four-year grant. I'm actually the principal investigator of the grant, but it's really the promotoras de salud that are doing the work. And we're fast uh, seizing on this issue of asthma and trying to get even more information as we talk. And other studies have been funded based on our study. So other scientists are working to really try to figure out what is going on here. We think it has something to do, by the way, with how the Dominican community still holds on to their traditional values and their ways of healing. They have less access to health care. Many of them are not documented, so they're not part of the whole uh, Medicaid uh, third-party reimbursement system, have no access to the hospital perhaps beyond the emergency room. So they actually have less interface with the uh, biomedical, allopathic kinds of approaches that exist for us. And they tend to deal with their own home remedies and their own traditions and their own sense of cultural unity. And so we think that that possibly has more to do with their ability to master their asthma and to prevent their asthma than anything else. But we're not sure, and we're looking into it. About the same time as the MASH ministers are moving the whole measles epidemic, a group of young people called the Toxic Avengers of El Puente show up on the scene. Now, in the early 90s, it was assumed that environmental quest were the province of white men on horses, the Sierra Club, um, not people of color, not particularly young people of color who had a myriad of issues to deal with. Why would they be involved in the environment? Well, the toxic adventures didn't think that. They felt that we had to be even more involved in our environment because we were living in the midst of these brown fields. That invariably when you when you saw horrible Superbug sites, they were invariably in people of in communities of color. And that it is no accident that we had in our community so many environmental horrors. We had one of the world's largest sewage treatment plants, admittedly run in an outlaw fashion. In fact, the city paid and went their reparations for its failure to run that sewage treatment plant by the rules. And the stench that came as a result of that was just horrible for the people who had to live around it. We were a community bisected by the Brooklyn Queens Expressway coming from Long Island and moving people onto Manhattan via the Williamsburg Bridge onto the famed Delancey Street. Um, we had uh, the Brooklyn's largest bus terminal with diesel buses spewing forth their polluted gases. We had, uh, uh, we're right in the middle of a lead belt and many of our young people were poisoned by lead. We had the largest oil spill coming from our neighboring community in Greenpoint underneath our feet, moving into our cellars, invading our homes, an underground oil spill larger than the oil spill of the Exxon Valdez. And we had the city's only nuclear and chemical storage plant right next to a public school about a couple of blocks from a Catholic school, right, of course, in the south side. So the toxic Avengers were right. So they came to me one day and said, Luis, we'd like you to reach out to the Hasidic community, to their leadership, because we think that cancer doesn't discriminate, respiratory disease doesn't discriminate, they have the same problems that we have. And it's because of places like Radiac, this nuclear storage facility. And they're about to have a hearing on emergency escape procedures from the community, which is a joke, because you can't go on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway to Long Island to escape. You can't go on the Williamsburg Bridge to escape. You can't escape. And they had actually gone to the community telling people how much time they had from the time a mushroom cloud would appear as a result of an accident in Radiac um, till they got to their doorstep. They went to the community and on the streets, you have three minutes, you have five minutes, telling people what was in their midst because most of the community didn't know that this existed. And today, to be honest, it wouldn't have never been licensed. But because the community didn't know what was going on at the time, because El Puente wasn't there and organizations like El Puente, they got away with it. 
And here they were. And so the Toxic Ventures were trying to build a movement along with others uh, throughout North Brooklyn to close down Maniac. And they knew that they needed the Hasidic community. That without a united community, we could do nothing. I didn't have the heart to tell them that I had tried. I had tried to reach out to the Hasidic community. But you know, they just didn't want to talk to us. To the Hasidic community, especially after PS16, especially after the rallies we had had uh, against uh, the assaults by their crime patrol, the Sham Rim Crime Patrol, on Latinos and African Americans. Because we had the rallies, we had the hearings, we did everything on our part to end and to close down that Sham Rim Patrol. To the Hasidic community, we were like Karakhan. We were Hasidim haters. They didn't see this as an issue of human rights, and they didn't see our wanting to try to talk to them to bring peace and try to work this out. They just saw us as being against them. But I didn't have the heart to tell them no. I said I would try. And I had really made a strong connection with the Jewish Community Relations Council that was very close to us, and also had made some inroads with the Sabmar Hasidic community. And so I called them. And they, they were so excited that I would even want to talk to the leadership. They said, Luis, we think we have some friends there. Let's try it. We'll get back to you. In a half an hour, I got a call back. A very excited leader of the Jewish Community Relations Council said, Luis, I can't believe it. There's been a new election. There's a new man head of the United Jewish Organizations. His name is Rabbi David Niederman. He's a refugee leader all over the world. And he wants to meet. He just wants to be guaranteed that he will be safe, that nothing will happen to him if he goes to a puente. I said, listen, he will be absolutely safe. We guarantee his safety in no way, because the tensions were so high. I can understand what you're saying. We were about to, to clash. In fact, nobody was worried about Crown Heights. Crown Heights had resolved this problem, had integrated its Shamrin patrol. Everybody was worried about the clashes of the Latino majority in the Hasidic community. Day after day, and it was uh, David Dinkins' office calling me and every week saying, Luis, how did it look? What's happening this week? Very nervous that something would explode. So he had a right to feel that he might not be safe. And when that rabbi walked through the doors of the Puente, remember, a former Roman Catholic church that still had St. Mary of the Angels, crucifix it all to place. When he walked through that door, it was like the president of Egypt going to Israel. It was like Nixon going to China. We all felt that we had turned the page in history. And we were so excited, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. And just sat down, he said, I'm here, let's talk. And the meeting went so well, I decided to push it a little bit. I said, listen, would you mind leading with us a march through our community to get people galvanized to go to this hearing. He said, I'd be honored to do that. Another courageous act. So if you can imagine what that hearing act was like. First of all, as we knew everything at a point that the dancers and the artists led it, dancing through the streets, and the Toxic Avengers, and all the rest of it went there. Rabbi David Niederman and myself, together. And people freaked. They opened up their windows and said, Oye, Luis, what's happening? Don't tell me they bought out El Puente too. Don't tell me you're giving in to them. Luis, don't do that. You can't do that. What are you doing with him? I mean, screaming this stuff out. He was hearing it. Screaming it out in English and in Spanish. Saying, what's going on here? El Puente is all we have. Don't do it. And then when they saw the picture, this was big news in the city of New York, and had our picture together and all the newspapers and all that. People for like a month would stop me on the street, and they had a lot of respect for El Puente. It's like Nick, only Nixon can go to China, but only El Puente could dare to speak about a coalition with the Hasidim. And people would say, Luis, we know you're a principled person. We know you haven't sold out. Why did you let them take a picture with you Rabbi, why, why are you even talking to them? And I said, I'm talking to them because of how we're dying in this community. 
because of the environment. And we've got to be able to stop a horror that's coming. And the horror that is coming is not just radiant, but this plan to build a 55-story incinerator in our community. It was like, this would be the linchpin to destroy us forever, to destroy a community that's had done everything to deal with this issues of justice, had done away with the, the gangs, had reclaimed parks, had done all kinds of beautiful things, and now just to stop us in our tracks, let's put an incinerator there. And it was cynical, because the original plan was to have a ring of incinerators all over, uh, all around the city of New York, out on the river. That was the original plan. And I said, well, maybe we'll just have an incinerator in the Bronx, and maybe we'll have one in Brooklyn, maybe in Queens, and that'd be enough to deal with New York City's garbage. You know about New York City's garbage, right? Nobody wants it. It's on barges, and it goes on all over the world trying to find a home. And they figured at 3 o'clock in the morning, in a contentious city council debate, on this law that they were about to pass, that if you put it in Williamsburg, nothing's gonna happen to you guys. I promise you nothing in the Bronx, nothing in Queens, nothing anywhere else. Just put the incinerator, a big one, in Williamsburg, and nothing will happen because Latinos and Hasidim hate each other, and they will never get it together to fight. So the city council, some of them are friends, out in my backyard, put it in Williamsburg. And so, it was a law. We are now to have a 55-story incinerator in Williamsburg. So Rabbi Niederman, Niederman and I, and with the help of Nyperg, we looked at each other and said, no way, no way. And we started building. And uh, within a year, we, had, we were ready to have 1,200 people come together. Where? In PS16. The symbol of our disunity. And 1,200 people got up and pledged their allegiance to a community alliance for the environment. That's spelled C-A-F-E, cafe. <laughs> by now you know how we do things, right? And it was a miracle. And we did everything in the world. You name it, we did it. There was only one permit left that was necessary for the city to get from the state to start building the incinerator. They had the plans, they had the equipment, they had the products, they had everything to go. They didn't have this one permit. And we did everything in the world to stop them from getting this one permit. Including, and one of the most outrageous things that we did, was we went over to the Daughters of the American Revolution. And we said to them, do you know about the Navy Yard, and do you know how our patriots were imprisoned in boats by the British right in the Navy Yard? I said, yeah, we know about that. So would you know that they were buried right there in the Navy Yard, right where they planned to build an incinerator, desecrating the memory of our Revolutionary War heroes? They said, my God, you're right. How could they do that? Can you imagine the daughters of the American Revolution Rabbi Niederman and myself and other people marching through the streets of Williamsburg? That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. And then our young people came up with the best challenge. They said, you know, we're learning science at the Puente Cat of Peace and Justice, and we see how important it is. And it should be the objective factor. Why don't we challenge them with science, please? And you know they were right. There was never an environmental impact study. So here's what we did. We had a press conference in the open air because that allowed for Hasidic uh, young men and women to be with our young men and women. And we had a press conference. And we challenged the mayor of New York City. We said, Mayor Giuliani, enough is enough. We've been doing this for years now. We will give up if you can get objective scientists, and you can choose the scientists, to study our community and to say it's a good idea to put a 55-story incinerator in our community. If they say that, we will go away. You have your permit. Well, of course, he couldn't do it. Because he knew he couldn't do it. And so he gave up. Couldn't do it. Could, I mean, ultimately it was so
Heinz that buckled to Giuliani, and he realized he could pull it off. A year later, we got Governor Pataki to sign a law forbidding acceleration forever, and it was a major victory of young people, adults, of people coming together as one community. I want to leave you in terms of my formal remarks, I know that we're going to have questions and answers, with this one scene, because I think it really reflects what we have to be about if we're really talking about peace and justice. We've got to be about building bridges, building relationships with people right here in this building and with people we don't know, little by little. I remember it was one of those strategies that we had to sort of keep the attention of the city on this and incinerate the struggle. And there was a group in uh, Lower East Side, called the Lower East Side, something or other, anyway. The acronym for them was Leche. So we said, why don't we have Café con Leche? <laughs> I can't make this up, it's true. <laughs> and so why don't we march Café, the Community Alliance of the Environment, over to Leche? And we'll have a big rally in Lower East Side, because we've never had one on that side of the river. And so we did, and we did so over 2,000 Latinos, Hasidim, African American, Asian Americans, uh, you know, every Italian American, Polish American, every group in our community represented, thousands of people crossing over the Williamsburg Bridge. Actually, no cars, where the cars were. Not, not, doing, not the walkway, but actually the roadway. And so, of course, we retorted to our old favorite, the people united will never be defeated. It was candlelight or flashlight because the candles were blowing out and we were using our flashlights. It was on the eve of Martin Luther King's birthday. We did it precisely because it was on the eve of Martin Luther King's birthday to show the city that this community was united on the principles of MLK. And uh, so after a while, it turned to Spanish. And I saw this 15-year-old Hasidic young man who had been sort of saying in English with a, another 15-year-old Latino young man side by side, walking together, marching. I saw him try to say, el pueblo unido jamás será vencido. But he couldn't do it. He was saying, el pueblo jamás será vencido. He couldn't do it. And, and, and the young Latino man was saying, you can do it. El, el pueblo unido jamás será vencido. And he was trying his best to do it, but eventually he got it. And he was screaming it like everyone that night. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. The people united will never be question about the accountability movement and the Regents exam. Does your high school have to take the Regents exam? Right. Uh, you know, when uh, Chancellor Fernandez had this big press conference and announced that El Puente would become a school, there was a major reaction in the city, particularly by a very reactionary newspaper called the New York Post. And immediately, they didn't know us at all, I don't think, but they wrote an editorial against us and against the Union 1199 against the Abyssinian Baptist Church that were all very different kinds of schools that were being planned, but all had the common theme of social change. And so the, and they particularly was were merciless on El Puente. Uh, they said, what are they gonna teach these kids how to, uh, you know, uh, shake down corporations? Uh, what is all this about? Why can't they teach them the three R's instead of demonstrating and all that kind of craziness? So, Francis, 
our leader, felt, you know what, this is going to continue. Um, people are not going to understand who we are and that we're about mastery and that we're about a rigorous education unless we do the regions. The regions were not compulsory then. As a school, you can decide to take them or not take them. She said, we have to take the regions. And of course, all of us said, oh, Francis, how can you say that? I mean, we're never going to be able to do the kind of project-based interdisciplinary work that we called for. She said, somehow we'll do that. We will stick to being a Quentin. But I think that no one is going to take us seriously unless we do the regions. And the only way that we can silence these critics for being a school for human rights is if we take them and do well. Of course, she was right. We all know she was right. And we did it. Now, New York Post kept coming at us, writing editorials against me. They assumed I was the principal of the school, this ex-young lord. You know, young lords like the Latino version of the Black Panther Party. And I led the Young Lords Party in Massachusetts when I was at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and taking all kinds of potshots, calling us horrible names. The Manhattan Institute wrote a major article calling us criminals. I mean, it was horrible stuff. And finally, about was it four years, three, four years ago, I can't remember, the New York Post, to stick it to the Board of Education and to all of us, actually printed the test scores of all those schools taking regions in the city of New York. Well, Stuyvesant High School is regarded as the number one school in the city, it's an exam school, you have to take an exam to get in, and it's a very good school. And so is the Bronx High School of Science. And so is Brooklyn Tech. But they weren't the number one school for passing regions in the city of New York. El Puente was. And as a result, as soon as Francis said that, she says, now nah, we ask for our waiver. And of course, the State Commission had no choice but to give it to us. So unfortunately, we enjoy about three or four years of portfolio assessment on multiple assessments, including portfolios. Um, and now, of course, the whole drive is to mandate that every public school, charter or non-charter, be required to take the regions. Which means that now the pressure on teachers is basically to teach the test. They don't have the luxury of doing what Acuente had been doing all these years. Um, they can't do, for example, what the private schools did. The state threatened private schools, that they would also have to take the regions or lose their New York State accreditation. You know what the private schools said? Oh, please, you think we need this? Our young people are going to Harvard, to Yale, and everything, so we don't need your New York State accreditation. And if you take it away, you take it away. It hasn't happened, but they have not been mandated to take the regions. So the policymakers, their children, go to private schools. At one point, we looked to see if even the chancellor's children was in public schools. No, the chancellor's children were in private schools. So they don't have to take the regions, but they're mandating a policy that is inconsistent with what we, with what we understand as education. If it, if it was not for the kind of uh, assessment, portfolio, project-oriented, interdisciplinary kind of education that we provide at Puente, we wouldn't have had young people uh, early admitted into Mount Holyoke and Sarah Lawrence and Syracuse and all the scholarships and all the schools that they've gone to, Cornell, and I mean, the list goes on. And maybe someday here, now that I know that you're here. Um, it wouldn't have happened, and now we are up against it, all of us are. We are part of the 35 school uh, consortium that is fighting it. We're now trying to get a legislate a law passed in the assembly, uh, and hopefully the Senate, which is Republican controls, so we don't know. But the law basically would say this. Those schools that are doing well, very well, let them continue doing what they're doing. If they grab, virtually everybody graduates from El Puente Academy of Peace and Justice, and everybody gets accepted to college. And they do well. So if El Puente and schools like El Puente in the state of New York are doing well, let them do what they've been doing well. And those that aren't doing well, and those that are doing very poorly, allow them to do the regions. But if they do as well as the El Puente-like schools in the state, they should also have their choice.
to go a different route should they see fit. Now, who can argue against that? Well, the commissioners. And it's his own Blue Ribbon Commission said, we recommend highly that you keep these schools as a control unit. And let's see five years from now, who does better? What can be the harm in that? It's only a small group of schools, relatively. No, everybody has to take it. So we're at a standstill. Um, the, um, there's a group of moms upstate from the city who have refused to let their children take these exams. They happen to be white, they happen to be upper middle class, and so they have the kind of cloud that's shaking a few things up. We have gleefully welcomed them to our struggle, and, and we're continuing to struggle. We don't know what's going to happen. But we're facing a, har a horrible, test-oriented kind of education, which is, I think, no education at all. Thank you. Question? I think it has in some ways, not necessarily in our own community, but in other communities. Um, again, unfortunately, people learn about a point that particularly in New York and come to see us and observe how we do it and everything else. And we're talking about incredibly beautiful, mostly arts-oriented kind of integration. Let me give you an example. Um, most of our parents, like my mother, worked in sweatshops as seamstress when they first came to this country. And so we wanted to look at the, at the history and technology and uh, sociology of, of garments. And we looked at it from every perspective and we created a dance and we created videos. We, we did oral histories. We did an amazing kind of integrated project that involved the entire school. It was so good, the American Museum of Natural History insisted that we present it at the museum. We did for like four or five showings on one weekend. Amazing! I learned so much myself, and, and to tell you the truth, I I watched the dance, and I remember picking my mother up, and uh, I cried because I remember what it felt like to pick her up from a horror as that factory was, and all of us felt that way. It was a wonderful piece of work. Well, that kind of work is now under attack by this whole push on test taking, and it's not test taking that we're against. I mean, I, we all take tests, but we think. Young people should know how to take tests. All kinds of tests, written tests, oral tests, whatever. But what we really are against is weighing a whole young person's value in school on the basis of one high stakes exam. In other words, you can do incredible work, but somehow if you, for example, if you could be an honor student in Chile, you come to this country in your senior year, you go into a public school, you can't pass the English regents, which you may have a hard time doing. Can't get a diploma. So it's kind of insane. Um, and that's what's, I think, limiting people from wanting to do the kinds of things that we're doing. We're trying to figure out how to use our after school program, how to, how to extend the day, how to extend the years. And it's, it's trying to figure out how to do both again. But nobody's part of it. So I don't know what we're going to do. Actually, there, there, there are a few that took our name. Uh, they don't tell us about it. I found out about it on the, on the internet. And it's fine, you know, it's no problem. Many groups have come to, to El Puente and we have uh, shared with them whatever we can and basically their principles and experiences. Because, you know, this idea of replicating a model that's kind of insane. What people can take is the spirit and the principles and their ability to root themselves in a, a more collective self-help framework. Focus on holism. Be about mastery and peace and justice. And, and, and we, we, we share our experience and help people understand how to do that. 
And so yes, people have done it in Massachusetts. Roca, a major example, leading uh, organization in the country in terms of multicultural work. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they, they have young people from Afghanistan, from Thailand, from all different countries, and somehow they all get it together. It's beautiful. And there are organizations in Detroit. The California Wellness Foundation created a whole five-year experiment of wellness villages based on it. So it's not extensions per se, but uh, it's really hooking into the principles and people then do their own thing. Okay, I know it's getting late and I know folks have 8 o'clock classes. That's all right. all good. Please join us. If you do have questions and would like to meet and talk with Luis in the social room, we have a reception there and everyone will be invited. Thank you.